Greetings and welcome back to Room 303 and AP English and our World of Ideas lectures. We are in Unit 8, Poetics, and we now turn to Lecture 48, Wordsworth's Preface to Lyrical Ballads from 1800. Now, we have, of course, talked at length about Wordsworth at LearnStrong.net in the AP folder. We've covered a number of titles of Wordsworth. And in fact, we begin with Wordsworth, don't we, at our uh, LearnStrong.net homepage, Intro to 303, Welcome to 303. When we start to talk about annotation, the act of active reading, where do we begin? My heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky. Uh, now, of course, this little ditty, The Child Becomes the Father of the Man, and I Can Wish My Days to Be Bound Each to Each by Natural Piety, that text resides in the text Lyrical Ballads. And, of course, we've talked at length about Lyrical Ballads in our introductory comments, especially for Tintern Abbey. We're now going to turn and specifically read the preface, which we have not yet done together in AP. So this is kind of exciting. Our assumptions are that you know well our earlier lectures um, on LearnStrong.net from World of Ideas, lectures 1 through 47, as well as our um, comments on Wordsworth, all available for you there. And, of course, we assume that you know about our learning theory, the desire to connect new information to old information in meaningful ways, and our active reading, our annotative approach at level one, summarizing what does the text say, at level two, what does it mean, studying as well the rhetorical concerns and the big five uh, for us at, at 2A, and then finally at level three, how can I relate to this information in some meaningful way? Let's see if we can uh, play that game together here, more specifically with the preface of Lyrical Ballads. We have said this is a really pivotal moment in 1800, the birth in many ways of English Romanticism, and, of course, a, a real powerful moment in the history of the arts. Finally, I hope you'll read this on your own and then come to get some help from me instead of the reverse. Let's do some quick background information. I've done a lot on Wordsworth already in other lectures, so I'm not going to say too much here. Obviously, the date, 1770 to 1850, of course, we call him an English Romantic poet. He follows the neoclassical period, as we have said, Pope and Swift re uh, represent in so, in so many ways. Very close to his sister Dorothy, of course, we've commented on this in that fifth major stanza of Ten Turn Abbey when he speaks directly to Dorothy. The preface to Lyrical Ballads, second edition, is 1800. And what happens is that Lyrical Ballads, when it was originally published, was controversial. He publishes it with his pal Coldridge. Of course, we have lectures on Coldridge at LearnStrong.net as well for Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner or Kubla Khan. My assumption is in some ways you've also maybe studied that because that um, that that. Um, talk, especially the methodology of interpretation as we talk about it with Rhyme of the Ancient Mentor, will be significant in our comments here. The first edition of Lyrical Ballads was not received well, especially by critics, because they didn't see it as poetry. I mean, if you look at what we just did with Pope's essay on criticism, and then you look at that little ditty I was reciting, my heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky, I get happy when I see rainbows, there were a lot of people that said, that is not poetry. What Shakespeare does in Sonnet 116, Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments, love is not love which alters when an alteration finds, that is poetry. What Pope is doing, for example, an essay on man, presume not God to scan, the proper study of mankind is man, that is poetry. But my heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky, that is not poetry. So Wordsworth felt compelled to defend what it was that he was constituting as his poetry, a new poetry, a new approach to poetry, and he's going to do it in Lyrical Ballads. So he writes this preface when he releases the second edition of Lyrical Ballads, and of course it becomes sentinel. It was one of those moments where Wordsworth, the great poet, was able to prove just how genius he is in prose as well. Now I like what Jacobus has to say uh, about Wordsworth's uh, Lyrical Ballads preface, and I'll go there on page 717. One of Wordsworth's, he says, extinct, extensive discussions concerns language in paragraph 8. He discusses at length the difference between the language of poetry and the language of prose, using examples from the poetry of Gray. We have um, um, elegy in a church uh, in a churchyard uh, already posted, and, and of course we've read it together at LearnStrong.net as well, right? His view is that there is no essential difference between the language of poetry and prose, but he also goes on to discuss the power of metrical language, its effect on the reader. Whitman, by the way, would argue the same thing across the Atlantic in the American tradition, and of course we have a lot of lectures on, uh, on Whitman and Leaves of Grass, don't we? Nonetheless, Wordsworth, just to continue, he maintains that the poetry in lyrical ballads he's used is, quote, a selection of the language really spoken by men, in quote, from paragraph 9. That is to say, the language 
of the common person. Whereas uh, Whitman will have made the same argument in his writing of Leaves of Grass, which, by the way, people like Melville and others argue was not legitimate poetry either. This statement expresses or represents an important break with poetic tradition in his time, and we are in fact looking at a break. If we said in our study of Machiavelli's Prince and earlier lectures of, uh, of World of Ideas that the break happens for Machiavelli when he, when he leaves the idealism, for example, of Plato, we have a similar kind of break happening here with Wordsworth, and it forever changes the world of the arts, right? That is to say, the arts then become more revolutionary in their attempts to try and change the way things have been from before. Wordsworth goes on, just to finish with Jacobus, to discuss the question of metaphor, in paragraph 9, the role of the passions, paragraph 12, the delusion that poets slip into as they write, paragraph 13, and the ultimate question, what is a poet, in paragraph 11. We'll get to that when we study our, our Virginia Woolf uh, letter to young poet in a bit. In paragraph 15, Wordsworth treats one of the most enduring of his, concept, of his concerns in poetry, emotion. As he says, quote, Poetry is the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. It takes its origin from emotion recollected in tranquility. Of course, the most famous maybe lines from this, uh, from this preface. Jacob is to finish now. These words have been examined in detail by critics over the years because they are key to understanding Wordsworth's own poetic practice. He intends us to understand that poetry comes not from the intellect alone, but from the powerful emotional life. My heart leaps up when I behold the rainbow of the sky. Right? However, he writes poetry not while he is in possession of powerful feelings, paragraph 15, but while he is reflecting on the experience. In other words, while he is enjoying the rainbow, he is enjoying the rainbow. He is not saying, I am happy, I am happy at this moment, the way children swinging apart don't say, I am happy, I am happy. That is a very adult kind of thing to think about. Wow, I'm happy standing at this concert right now. No, no, no. Wordsworth's going to argue, be at the concert, enjoy the concert, and then afterwards, in some kind of language, poetic prose, whatever, try and capture that language in some way. The best writers, the best poets are the ones that are able to do that. Okay, on the rhetoric side, Jacobus points out that Wordsworth really works hard to try and define and defend, in many ways, his terms, because that's going to be central to what it is that he wants to say uh, about, uh, about language. Just to finish what Jacobus has to say on 718, he says, Wordsworth had high expectations. He wrote a direct, unadorned prose, but he also made demands on the reader's attention. His preface Paragraphs are very long, so point that out. You're going to have to work through them, right? Especially for our modern taste. But their length was warranted by the fact that Wordsworth developed his ideas thoroughly and carefully. His language is simple, uncomplicated, much as he recommends in his own poetry. He also speaks directly to the reader, paragraph four. We'll, we'll see this, of course, as well in our study of Whitman, as we've already pointed out. So, as if soliciting the reader's patience. The reference to the reader as a man is common to the period. It does not necessarily imply an anti-feminist view. Obviously, uh, his most cherished reader was always Dorothy. And w one of the achievements of the Romantics was to begin developing a modern feminist attitude. No question, we've talked about this at length, right, in other lectures. Let's now turn at level one and summarizing to the text itself and just work through the 15 long paragraphs, right? In paragraph one, he says, in writing these poems, I drew my subject matter from simple common life and used ordinary rather than artificially poetic language. My heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky. Now, some of you will say, that sounds awfully artificial to me. Dude, he wasn't writing it to you. He was writing it for people of 1800. You got me? So it's very, it's very simple language at that time. At the same time, he says, I tried to reveal the extraordinary qualities found in simple things, right? Rainbows, for example. I, paragraph two, I deplore the debased thought and language in some popular poetry today. My poems, unlike these, have a worthy purpose. All good poetry originates from the spontaneous outpouring of feelings, but these feelings must be modified and shaped by thought. Good poetry must enlighten the reader's mind and improve his capacity to feel. Of course, we would say absolutely. I mean, this is the whole point of reading great works of literature. It challenges us in our own thinking, at least we hope at level three, right? Paragraphs three through four. My poems, he says, also differ from popular poetry in their emphasis on subtle rather than coarse emotions. I believe that the human mind has the capacity to be excited without the use of crude stimulants. And my aim is to enlarge that capacity. Today, many forces, he says, including the dreary uniformity of urban life, we know about this from our, from our study of, of Tintern Abbey, make people crave violent stimulation. As if it was true in 1800, how much more true is it today, right? Despite this, he says, I believe that the higher permanent qualities of the human mind will prevail. We certainly hope so. It's one of the reasons we study great ideas, right? 
Paragraph 5. The style of my poems differs from that typically found in poetry. I've avoided artificial diction, conventional phrases, figures of speech, preferring instead concrete language. My heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky and exact, direct description. Paragraph 6 through 8. He then becomes somewhat um, um, comparative. Watch this. Some critics claim that the language of poetry must differ from that of prose. But a sonnet by Gray, we know, we know about uh, Thomas Gray from our study already, shows that this is not necessarily the case. I believe, in fact, that the language of poetry is essentially the same as the language of prose. Poetic language should not be elevated or regarded as unique. And, of course, this comes to fruition in the great work of James Joyce, right? We think about the, the novel Ulysses, or, as we have lectured it, Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. Are you reading poetry? Are you reading prose? Well, Joyce is so great. It's a combination, obviously. Paragraph 9. For poetry, he says, I recommend, quote, a selection of the language really spoken by men, end quote. When chosen with taste and feeling, such language is in itself naturally dignified, varied, figurative, making the addition of artificial poetic devices unnecessary. Many argue that he learned this from Shakespeare. There's some good argument for that. Paragraph 10. If my unconventional poetic principles were accepted, he says, standard judgment about the works of great poets would be changed dramatically. I think he's right about that, by the way. Paragraph 11, although he is, quote, a man speaking to men, end quote, the poet possesses powers that exceed those of other men, including greater emotional sensitivity, greater insight into the human nature, and a more powerful imagination. When, of course, go to our comments on James Joyce's portrait of the artist as a young man, Joyce asked the question, are poets born or are they made? He believes in large measure they're born and then they're nurtured, of course, to see the world fundamentally differently, which is why we need artists, right? Paragraphs 12 through 13, however, great the poet's powers. His language must often fall short of the language that is spoken by men at moments of great emotion. The poet should strive to identify closely with the emotion of those persons he describes. He should select natural language that will capture the finest aspects of that emotion, which makes sense. I mean, if you read really fine novels, for example, and it sounds so real that, you know, the pictures are so well drawn, then you're inclined to keep reading, right? Paragraph 14, some advise poets to use elevated language to heighten emotion, but such advice shows little understanding of the nature of poetry, for the aim of poetry is truth. And the poet must strive to present as directly as possible the truth of the human heart. Now, there's, of course, a huge debate about this today, but it still makes sense to look at a line like, the child is father of the man, and I could wish my days to be bound each to each by natural piety. As we have said in 303 for many, many years, that is a compelling set of lines and an idea or two that must give one pause. What do adults, uh, us, have to learn from children? It's a very interesting question. I don't learn from you, you learn from me. Really, why? Because I'm older than you. Does that necessarily make you right? Well, no, not necessarily. And why is it so hard to devote our lives to pious actions, right, to, to piety? Um, and now to finish, paragraph 15, poetry, he says, quote, and this is the most maybe famous lines of, of a really important essay on poetry and language. Poetry is, quote, the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings recollected in tranquility, end quote. The poet communicates his feelings and in doing so gives pleasure. Descriptions written in verse give greater, more lasting pleasure than those written in prose. And um, one of the great poets of 303 that we love to talk about all the time, Seslav Misha, says the same thing in his treatise on poetry, that a single good set of lines can carry more weight than a whole, what does he say, wagon full or wheelbarrow full of prose. Let's take a look now at level two and three, at, the, at 2A, our big five as we call it, epistemology and what one can know. Well, I think the argument here is the fallibilist position, I think I'm right but I could be wrong, versus the absolutist position of poetry. And of course, he's going to make the argument, don't be so certain you absolutely know what great poetry is. Be aware that you could be wrong. Ontologically, of course, well, who are we? It's clear, Wordsworth wants to argue, we are emotional beings. And as emotional beings, we need a means whereby to express and qualify that emotion. Psychologically, of course, we must strive, right, to overcome our fear and our anxiety about creative originality. Sociologically, we are all connected by spirit, and then we have to respect that. Where do we connect? Through art, of course, following the arguments of, of um, Aristotle, right? What does this text say about theodicy and the question about pain and suffering in the world? Well, go back to uh, um, the world is too much with us, Leighton Sue. 
getting and spending, we lay waste our powers, little we see in nature that's ours, we've given our hearts away, a sort of boot. That is to say, we create a lot of our own pain and suffering in this world because we don't understand what matters, what is real, right? That, what does he call it in Tentern Abbey? That hour of thoughtless youth instead of those elevated thoughts. And of course, great writing and great art helps us elevate our thoughts. At 2A, obviously the best art is natural. The best art speaks to that side of us that captures notions of the powerful emotions. Of course, being a writer involves having experiences and then later trying to qualify those experiences in profound ways. At level 2B, well obviously this is an interesting and compelling argument vis-a-vis -vis all kinds of interesting lines and word pictures. At 3A, well, we're just going to say all of the romantic writers that we have on Learn Strong from Burns, you know, to a mouse, to a louse, to Blake, Songs of Innocence, Songs of Experience, from Lamb and, and Tiger, Chimney Sweeper, as well as Infant Sorrow, to Byron, of course, and Shelley and Keats, and all of those writers that we call the second generation of writers to follow Wordsworth. They were all very influenced by this kind of thing. So when Keats starts coughing out blood, he will, of course, say, when I have fears that I may cease to be before my pen has gleaned my teeming brain. But he'll finish that most obvious of statements when you know you're going to die, it freaks you out. He says, then on the shore of the white world I stand alone and think to love and fade to nothingness to sink. And go back and take a look at all those, all, all those lectures again. From the, through the prism of this, of this essay, I think it's fascinating to do so. Finally, at 3B, what was the time your creativity and your independence was challenged and you had to defend yourself the way that Wordsworth is trying to defend himself here? And then finally, what do you think is the best art? How do you qualify that? Like for you, what's your best film? What's your best video game? What's your best song? Favorite, by favorite, best way favorite, that speaks to you. And then ask the critical question, why? No, we're not going to answer in childlike language, why well, I like it. No, 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 why? What is it that it moves in you? It taps something emotively, intellectually. What is that and how does that work? Good writers are always wondering that. Well, I hope that this has enhanced your reading study of Wordsworth. Thank you.